congratulations. Now we are recording as well. We have Oslo, we have Finland, we have Bergen, we have her space again. Uh, great. It's great to see all of you here. Hi from Abidjan. Hi, Lynn. Hi, Chris. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying the warm weather in there. Uh, so usually what happens is that we officially start the session five minutes past one, just to give a little bit of time uh, to the latecomers or not really latecomers because five minutes is still very much okay. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping so that uh, when the time comes, we can just start right ahead. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, just to let you know, this session is uh, currently live streamed on LinkedIn. Uh, even if your videos are on, it is only the speakers who are spotlighted who will be visible uh, on the LinkedIn live stream. Uh, we are also recording this session, uh, which means that it will later on be available on our YouTube channel. And uh, we are also uh, going to turn it into a podcast. So you will be able to just listen to it while you're going to work from work going to gym, uh, whichever uh, time you choose for that. Um, also, in terms of accessibility, uh, the live transcription option is available uh, for all of you, so you can request for it. But however, from our previous experience, we have seen that uh, the screens, tends, uh, they tend to freeze or have some malfunctioning when the live transcription option is on. So just be aware of that. Um, and when it comes to the length of this panel discussion, for some, it might be too long, for some, not long enough, but it takes uh, two hours, so 120 minutes, out of which uh, 90 minutes are reserved for the discussion among the panelists with the questions we have uh, prepared. And the last 30 minutes is when we open the stage for you, our dear participants and audience, so just feel free to ask as many questions as possible. This is gonna be your stage. So please ask questions and for 30 minutes, we're gonna answer as many as we will be able to, or our panelists, not me. Um, we definitely encourage discussions within the chat. Uh, as uh, we are already chatting now, we also have Omar joining us from Milan. Welcome, welcome. Uh, so feel free to write any thoughts that will pop up in your mind um, as our panelists speak and, uh, and answer the questions we have prepared so far. And in case you have any questions, you don't have to wait for the Q&A session. You can already start writing in your questions as we speak, and we're just going to find them later on and ask. So possibly the sooner you put in your question, uh, the more it's possible that I'm going to actually have the time to ask. And uh, just to make it a bit easier for me and my colleagues, always preface the question with the word question so that we know it's not just a comment. And in case you are targeting any of our panelists, just write their names in the chat. Uh, unfortunately, one of our panelists, Chi, uh, will not be joining us for the last 30 minutes of the session. Uh, because they have other responsibilities uh, and duties. So we know that they are not joining us for the last time as a panelist. So uh, keep those questions for the next time, hopefully. Uh, yes, so that has been the housekeeping part. Now let's come to the panel discussion part. So I officially welcome all of you. It is six minutes past 1 p.m. in Oslo but we are having panelists joining us from different time zones. Uh, so that's a very interesting today. Uh, also, we do have four panelists joining us, even though I can, okay, there's Vanessa, great. <laughs> uh, so um, we are a bit more rich today when it comes to the number of panelists joining uh, this discussion. Uh, so I welcome all of the panelists joining us. Uh, we are going to get into the introductions very soon, uh, but before we do that, let me just introduce the topic a little bit and introduce myself. So today is um, our second, pan uh, second panel discussion in 2022, 
um, within the series of diversity and inclusion in the workplace, series that are powered by Diversify and Her Space. And we have been having these discussions since December 2020, which to me sounds like it was just two months ago, but no, 2021 actually happened. Uh, so uh, we've been having these discussions for a while, and today we are going to discuss the topic of racial equity. A big topic for some might be a heavy topic, uh, but it's very important to have these discussions, as I have already mentioned. Uh, so uh, I'm going to let the speakers to talk more about the topic itself, because I am not an expert on this. Uh, so let me just introduce myself. So I'm the moderator for today. My name is Azana Warden. I'm a project and research manager at Diversify. And my professional background is in project management, international development, cooperation, social work. Uh, and uh, for uh, those who are joining us and uh, who, who might be having visual impairments, I'm just going to describe myself as we usually do uh, at the beginning of each panel discussion. So I am a uh, white female uh, with a slim pale face, um, brown eyes, red lipstick, yellow sweater, and long brown dreadlocks. Today I made an effort and you can see it or not, but there are flowers behind me, a white board and a yellow wall. Uh, so that is me. And now without further ado, I would like uh, to hear the introduction of our uh, amazing panelists. And I think we can just start quickly with Chisom. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chisom Udeze. I am the founder of Diversify, and I'm really, really excited to be here uh, uh, to learn from these amazing uh, panelists. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. And uh, I am a black woman, uh, uh, brown skin, curly hair with fringe or bangs uh, almost over my eyes, wearing a white shirt. Uh, and my background is pretty much a boring white background. No flowers or no plants like Susanna. So really happy to be here. Welcome to some. Next on my screen is uh, Chi Lee. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chi. My pronouns are they, them. I'm actually dialing in from New York, so I'm saying good morning to everyone. And I am of Chinese descent uh, from Hong Kong, and I'm really excited to participate in this panel. I am by no stretch of the imagination a true expert per se, but I do have a lot of opinions and a lot of things that I've come across during my education that I would love to share in this very important conversation. And I have long brown hair. Um, I'm sitting in front of my window, so hopefully there's no black glare that silhouettes me. Um, and I have a very over-patterned textile uh, behind me. And I have a angular face and brown eyes. And I'm in front of my kitchen light as well, I just noticed, and it, it's creating this weird sense of a halo on my left. But pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you here, Chi. Uh, next on my screen is Kristen, please. Can you introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. My name is Kristen. I am a, an American uh, living in Norway. Um, I am Black biracial. Uh, I'm sitting in my home office, mostly white background with some plants and some uh, colorful yarn art that was a gift from a friend from Mexico. Uh, I work for Papillon uh, in Bergen, uh, and um, I use she, her pronouns, and uh, really happy to be here. Thank you very yeah. much for your introduction, Kristin. Uh, I see that Vanessa has been going on and off the screen. Vanessa, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Just a bad internet connection. <laughs> yes, uh, can you please introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Vanessa Akboy. I'm an operations program manager based in Santa Barbara, California. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I have a black shirt, red eyeglasses, and very fluffy hair. <laughs> and my background is a plant and a couple of pictures in the background. Thank you very much for your introduction, Vanessa. Just to give a shout out to Vanessa, it's 4 a.m. where she's joining us from and she still looks 
fabulous. Um, so yes, thank you very much for, for waking up this early to join this conversation. Uh, so these are it. our amazing panelists right here. And uh, we are gonna start with our first big question. Um, so today we are going to discuss the topic of racial equity. And uh, if I may just preface that with a little bit of a definition I have found, is that racial equity is a process of eliminating racial disparities and in that way improving outcomes for all of us. It is the intentional and continual practice of changing policies, practices, systems, and structures by prioritizing measurable change in the lives of people of color. That is a big definition. Uh, and we are definitely gonna dissect it today. Uh, but I would like to ask our panelists, uh, from your perspective, what is it to be a person of color existing in the world today? And let me start by Chi, who can give us a perspective of an Asian non-binary person. Um. From my perspective, personally, I think uh, as a person of color uh, that's intersectional, I think it's uh, it demands a lot more um, nuance to engage the world, and it demands a lot of sensitivity and forbearance, and especially being generous, not just with myself and how I engage the world and how I perceive it, but and it's reciprocal of how it's perceiving me because of all the multitude of my identities that may not be immediately registered by others. So as a person of color, and I can only speak specifically to America in particular, that that definition of person of color resonates very different for me as an Asian immigrant than it does for someone that may identify as black and brown in America. Um, and so as a person of color, it demands that level of nuance and sensitivity not just to engage the world, but how I respond with generosity and not be dogmatic about it so that I can maintain some semblance of mental health for myself. Yes, thank you for, for your answer. Uh, let's uh, hear from other panelists as well so we can kind of create a whole round idea. Um, so I would like to ask uh, Vanessa to give us a perspective from a Black African-American woman's uh, world view. Uh, Vanessa, are you there? Yes, I'm here. For myself, being African American in the US, I find that I have a better sense of self than I think I would have if I were living in a different time, say 20, 30 years ago. I think that with the availability that people have to connect with others, other races and also in different locations. I think it's been a really great time to become more aware of everyone's different situations and being able to share experiences with each other and to be able to get to know one another. So for myself, it's been a journey of knowing myself and knowing others and just being more aware of what's going on and seeing different perspectives. So I'm really grateful that I am born in this time and that we are able to share so many of our experiences together. So that's what it, it means to me to be a person of color is to, to share and to also learn myself. Yes, thank you, Vanessa. We are definitely living in times when the conversations have shifted and have been uh, you know, quite uh, vivid in the last year. So that is, that is great. We need more and more of that. Um, just to repeat the question, just to remind our participants, um, uh, so I'm just asking from the perspectives of our participants, what is it to be a person of color existing in the world today? And next on my screen is Kristen. Please, could you give us a um, perspective of a, a biracial black and, uh, and white biracial woman? There we go, I'm muting. Uh, yeah, uh, for myself growing up um, biracial and having a, um, a evolving sense of my own racial identity, um, that has meant being very uh, thoughtful 
uh, about the different ways in which our um, different identities intersect. And um, uh, I've, used, I've used a lot of uh, time reflecting on unpacking assumptions um, about the language that we use and about the meanings that we ascribe to things. Um, you know, what does it mean to be white, black, white, racial? Um, and I has really given a insight into the limitations that language uh, offers uh, when we're attempting to articulate and express to others the ex way we experience the world and ourselves and one another. So yeah, it's being thoughtful and conscientious and always open to uh, evolution. Yes, thank you, Kristen. We will definitely get back into the topic of language very soon. So we will ask you more about that. Uh, but Chisam, can you also give us a perspective of a, a Black African woman? What is it to be a person of color existing in the in the world today for you? Um, uh, uh, okay, so I, I think that on, on the basis of, you know, my race, uh, um, it's, it's, you know, it's intersections of, you know, it, it's a privilege, it's wonderful, it's humbling, and sometimes it's violent. You know, I think that this extreme experiences, uh, you know, they give me quite a broad perspective across uh, uh, my various intersectionalities and some of which I, you know, I'm, I am Nigerian, which means that in some way, I do not identify as a minority, at least when I'm home or on the continent, African continent, because I was always told that I am a majority of over 200 pe million people, right, in my country alone. And then having to socialize that when I'm outside of my continent. Um, and of course, knowing you know the histories and the cultures that I come from that is rooted in norms and traditions that pre predate and transcends me. Um, you know, so I think that also being African and, and existing in the West, being cisgendered, being heterosexual, being privileged within like socioeconomic standing, it allows me to appreciate, acknowledge and identify how I move through layers, you know, of privilege and the lack thereof in the world. So in my home or, or in spaces where I feel safe, I feel, you know, like this is a profound privilege, but in the outside world, I, Think that it can sometimes be exhausting, complicated, messy, <laughs> and honestly, sometimes quite difficult to articulate. You know, I think admittedly, my my the opportunities and the privileges I've had in my life have shielded me from many. Uh, uh, since we're talking about race equity, uh, racial equity here, has shielded shielded me from many. Uh, um, outright hateful racist experiences, although I have had my fair, fair share, you know, nonetheless, I feel that I exist in a world where I have to navigate systems and structures that were not built for me. You know, I, I encounter, uh, uh, say, microaggressions, gaslighting, unconscious biases, conscious biases, anti-Blackness on a frequent basis. And, and, and also just taking it to the granular, reflecting on the fact that I grew up you know, uh, singing lullabies that were harmful to people like me and inhaling versions of religion that were not representative of me. You know, so it's, for me, it's a messy <laughs> process and I hope I was able to articulate that messiness uh, through my answer. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your answer, Chisom. Uh, so yes, our dear uh, participants, uh, you could hear four different perspectives, and this is what we are starting our panel discussion with. You're going to uh, hear um, different views of, of people from different backgrounds living with different intersectionalities, just as we all do talking about the topic of racial equity. And for the next question, I'm just going to, again, preface it with a definition, and I promise this is the last time that you're going to hear my voice for such a prolonged span of time. Um, but I just uh, think it's very important for us to address or just uh, present 
the definition of racism uh, to continue within this uh, conversation. Uh, and so it goes, uh, racism can be defined as prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism by an individual, community, or institution against a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalized. Institutions play an important role in perpetuating racism. They include schools, the court system, the media, health systems, and organizations. Institutions and history work together to give certain groups of people more of a say in how their country is built and the systems and structures that benefit the people who exist within that country. So I'm also going to just copy paste this definition into the chat for uh, all of you because it's it's a long one. So you can just read it once more if you need that. But um, having this uh, definition on the table, I would like to ask our panelists if it's okay with you. Can you describe one of the ways in which you experience racism? Uh, and I think I would like to ask uh, uh, Vanessa first. Thanks. Yeah, you know, it's, it comes in different forms. And for someone who hasn't experienced it before, it may seem very subtle. For myself, one item that comes to mind is, as part of one of my previous roles, you have to hold meetings and, you know, to gather information. And at the time, I was with a Caucasian woman, and we were in the South, and we were interviewing with a Caucasian man. However, for that section, I was the lead for it. And when I was asking questions, the gentleman would only look at an answer to my coworker. And I could tell that that was a very uncomfortable situation. And so, you know, you would think, okay, maybe he just thought that he was just looking at one person to answer the question, but this was repeatedly and throughout the meeting, I was asking the question and still getting she would get the responses back. And so in that case, you know, you think, was he misunderstanding? I don't think so because it was very clear and she tried to redirect it back to me to say that I think she asked you the question and not myself. And so some of the, sometimes the discrimination can be very obvious and sometimes it can be very subtle, but that's just a really good example of of what it could look and what it could look like, what it can look like and what it is look like. Um, some people, it may be a little bit more nuanced where you may not get the same opportunities and you just think to yourself, is it because of X, Y, and Z? You know, is it because I'm a woman? Is it because I'm disabled? But in that situation, you could clearly tell the only visible difference between us was race. Thank you for sharing your experience, Vanessa. From our previous conversations, we know that you like to give good examples, so our <laughs> participants can be looking forward to more of that. Um, uh, next on my screen is uh, Kristen. Could you share uh, or describe one of the ways in which you experience mm -hmm. or have experienced racism? <clears throat> sure. So, um, uh, and as a result of these past couple of years of um, during this pandemic, um, the inter most of my interactions have been with you know close friends and family, and I and I work in a really wonderfully diverse place where it's yeah not where we're all different places. Um, so it's been a while since I have uh, in, really been exposed to a lot of in-person uh, racist experiences. Um, so. What I would say, though, is that um, one of the most uh, disheartening uh, experiences for me is uh, when uh, people can so quickly uh, dismiss or disregard the, the lived uh, experiences of uh, people of color. And when I have uh, tried to uh, express uh, an experience I had that was uh, racist and to have it be dismissed uh, or to um, yeah, question my own understanding of my own experience uh, from people in my life um, that, yeah, that really uh, leaves, leaves a mark and is really hurtful. So. 
Yes, thank you for sharing, Kristin. Um, so next, I would like to ask Chi, could you share your experiences? Um, I, wow, those are some very powerful examples, and thank you. But um, I think for me, it's more complicated um, because uh, living in America, and I think some of the panelists are perhaps really familiar, uh, there's intersectionality and there's what we understand as internalized racism. And that's one of the things that I've experienced growing up and the implications of it. I, I almost want to say that it's too easy to place the onus on a white power structure as we understand it in America, but that sort of filters into say the Asian community because of certain stereotypes of sexuality and I'm intersectional. I identify as non-binary gender fluid under the transgender umbrella. And as a result of that, the toxicity of identifying as male within the Asian community has become incredibly important within the America framework of race. And when you don't fit that, that neatly, you get ostracized. And growing up in a uh, in subsidized housing developments, I was very um, I was probably the first family of Asians in those communities, and those communities were predominantly made up of black and brown families, and they welcomed me in. But because their assumption is, as they were presented by historical evidence, that Asian quote unquote men by biology are effeminate, so that is just who they are. But the implications of that stems from a racist perspective, even if they have accepted me into their community as an Asian person within a black and brown diaspora. So that's how I experienced racism, its implications, as well as its internalized versions of it by your own people. Thank you so much, Chi, for bringing uh, even more nuance into, into this conversation. And uh, I would also like to ask Chisom, could you share uh, some of your experiences? Yes. Um, so I think, yeah, I probably also have to nuance it a bit. Uh, uh, how I experience racism varies. You know, I have experienced racism in the ways many of us expect when we think about what is a racist action. So I've been, an example would be that I've been verbally abused in every horrible, degrading word possible for an hour and a half, and half on the train uh, in Switzerland, where I was the only person of color. And for that entire time, you could hear a pin drop and not a single person on the train, not even the people I was with said a single word. So I've had those. You know, last summer in um, uh, Norway, um, I, uh, um, just close to Oslo, I uh, uh, was, a car ran me off the road. <laughs> There's no other way to say it, I guess, and yelled the N word at me as I ran for safety. So I've also had situations like that. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, I the ways I experience racism is often based, like often through unconscious biases that show up in, you know, microaggressions. So for example, a uh, offhand comments about my glorious hair, uh, uh, gaslighting, you know? So for example, that would be when someone says, oh, but my other black friend or that other person of color I know does not think that there's anything wrong with this or that, you know? Or in anti-blackness, you know, comments about my daughter's skin color, for example, you know, uh, one of my uh, husband's warming and friends, you know, said that it would be great if my unborn child, had my beautiful features and my husband's skin color. My husband is white, you know? So I think these examples of racism, you know, when I tell them, you know, they're obviously wrong, but sometimes, I think a lot of times they're actually well-intentioned. Some people think them as compliments and other times they are not even directed at me. You know, uh, I had a man 
walk into my space. I have a co-creations co-creation space uh, in Oslo, her space. Uh, uh, and he was so stunned that it was owned by an African and a black woman. He also wondered, you know, who was funding me and where I got the money from to, to you know, to set it up. And then he proceeded to tell me that he was so very impressed and that I should be proud because other Africans he knew in Oslo were either drug dealers or thieves. Right, uh, so that was a compliment for me. <laughs> and so I think for me that racism also shows up in Oslo or in Norway or my experience in the West because I'm often seen as a model black person. You know, it's how white acceptable I am, you know, uh, how easily, for example, say a family member can tell me to avoid Grunland, which is a very diverse area in Oslo, because it's filled with immigrants and black and brown people who were often riffraffs. But of course, it had nothing to do with me because I'm different. So it's, yeah, it, it's complex. Uh, and oftentimes it's in, you know, those microaggressions that are unintentional. Thank you for sharing, Tissom. It's, it's very important to acknowledge, you know, we oftentimes imagine racism is coming from a place of hate, and it's this very obvious act uh, or verbal expression, but it can actually be coming from a good intent, but not the, the, the best programs. We have been um, uh, taught throughout our lives. Uh, so thank you so much, all of you, for sharing these experiences. I can imagine that it, it can be a very personal topic to discuss, uh, but uh, we are really grateful for uh, to, to hear your views on this and uh, we are looking forward to hearing more from you so uh, the questions that are coming up next will be targeted towards uh, individual panelists uh, but uh, in case any of the other panelists feel, feel like they want to um, add anything to it please uh, feel free to do so so my next question uh, we are kind of entering the topic of language, as, as Kristen has already uh, talked about it a little bit, because language is a living organism and it's ever changing as the society also keeps on evolving. And in the case of language connected to race, uh, there have been certain terms which have been more prominent in the societal discourse in the last years, such as structural racism, people of color, allyship, etc. Um, and they have steered a lot of discussions. So Kristen, we're coming back to you because you have already mentioned the topic of language. So I would like to ask you, what are your thoughts about the latest evolution in language used to discuss race and the mixed reactions it has raised? Uh, well, for one, I think it's really important to see uh, the expansion of language and the, the changes in language as a reflection of more voices being included in the conversation. And that the that language is kind of an ongoing project of co-creation. And uh, what I see when people have can have a reflexive resistance, to new, new terms or new understandings of old terms, um, that, that resistance begs, requires a little introspection and reflection about what that is about. And I see it as a um, kind of in tacit acknowledgement about the relationship between language and, and power and who gets to say, who gets to say in what, uh, what, what matters and what things mean. And, um, you know, what's important when you're in a conversation with somebody uh, is do we have a shared understanding? You know, we, we opened this, um, this uh, panel conversation with establishing some shared definitions, a shared framework, uh, and then establishing are we engaging in good faith? Are we, are we talking in a way to uh, advance our, our understanding of one another? Uh, is this leading to connection? Is this moving the conversation forward? Um, you know, I think that that, 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 that connection and that, that good faith engagement is necessary to have meaningful conversations uh, about race. 
right, add on to that. So, you know, change is hard. It is really hard. But with change, there's also the element of willingness. So when you're in business, it's a little bit easier sometimes to be willing to accept the change. Oh, unfortunately, have we have we lost Vanessa for a second? Uh, it seems so. And when it comes to communication, oh, shoot. Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> it was just in relation to change being hard and you have to have a willingness when it comes to business, even when it comes to communication, we're using new terms that we haven't used previously, the new normal, um, you know, just different things. So when, similar to what Kristen said, when we have different terms to new terms to give a face to old understandings, that's just a way of being able to contextualize it to make it a little bit more relevant to people. So when you do see a new term, you know, don't be exhausted. Like I can't believe it or that I have to learn something new or why can't we just stick to the old terms? We're trying to make it more inclusive. When I say we, as in the collective, we across the world, we're just trying to make it a little bit more relevant, a little bit more that we can relate to with a little bit more understanding because as you, as you go through and you learn more you need to be able to give it a name. You need to be able to explain it so that for the next generation, they can take that learning and then even expand upon it more. So maybe, you know, decades from now, institutionalized racism may have a different name, may have a different context, and it may mean something different to someone else. So I would just say when you do come across that, you know, don't fear the change, just as you wouldn't fear it for, you know, in other aspects of your life, professional or personal you know, digest it as you can, look into it, explore it a little bit more and just be a little bit more willing to be open to the understanding for it. Thank you very much, Kristen and, and Vanessa as well for, for uh, adding more thoughts into it. Um, my next question is- no, Could for I just add something specific? 100%, uh, go for it. Um, 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 I just wanted to add to that and Kristen and Vanessa spot on. I, I, I also wanted to add that uh, you know, there is something that is quite remarkable about specificity, you know, so even with language that we have today, if let's call racism, racism, as opposed to discrimination, you know, let's call, let's name things by what they are, as opposed to, you, you know, using this umbrella term that makes us more comfortable. So I think there's power in also naming things as we know them today and also you know as Christine and you know Vanessa said being open to that change that comes when we know better you know when we know better we do better thank you also, for adding that <laughs> oh yes G. Yeah, just just a quick just a quick uh riff on what's been said thus far is that I also want to circle back to the power of language is understand that you um it's nuanced which goes back to what Chizom had just said about the specificity of it but more importantly it is about in the evolution of language, we have reclaimed and recovered certain amounts of power. For instance, when uh, I grew up in a black and brown community and I was told in a certain time where you can only use African-American to describe black people, but as the generations change, some individuals may not prefer to be called African-American. They just simply want to be called black because there's certain specifics to it. But furthermore, the use of the N-word in certain communities communities have redefined a certain sense of brotherhood within communities of black and brown dynamics. And so just as the F word within the LGBT community has a certain exchange of parity in it. And I think that we have to also engage language in its multitude and its nuance. And I think we also have to understand which what uh, Kristen also said, and it's actually said very well by uh, a global artist, Lorna Simpson, who said that sometimes language just does not jibe with me. And sometimes it may require different forms of representation. And that representation may be just simply the way we look may demand that you respond to me differently and think and consider what words are going to come out of your mouth before you say them and before you even think them that it's okay to be said, that it requires that sensitivity and nuance. And I think that sometimes um, is what's missing because we're so quick, as she's going to point out, that we want to do good 
as we're moving forward and want to be in this collective sharing process. But we forget that we have to understand that not everyone receives language the same way, especially for those of us are multilingual, that in translation, something can be missed or in interpretation, something can be missed. And I think that becomes problematic when we don't think about how sensitive language can be because it, it has affinity to each person, both culturally, racially, sexually, and whatever there may be in terms of our identity. Thank you so much, Chi. You have actually probably answered the question I had ready for you next. Now I'm, I'm quite in a dilemma trying to figure out what to do. Should I ask? Should I not ask anymore? <laughs> uh, but maybe I can just uh, read it. And, and if there's anything else you would like to add, you can, you can do that. But I think you have really covered it so well. My question uh, was, you know, there is historic, systemic, and structural power behind language. Could you speak to how language has and can be used to empower or enslave people? Um, yes, I'm, I do apologize. I jumped, I jumped ahead, but um, it's, I think that there is a, a great deal of hegemony in language. And I think the fact that I actually have to speak English and speak it fluently to be, to be accepted, that in itself is enslavement and empowerment simultaneously. I, because I am empowered by having command of the language to move through space fluently in American society or Western society. But it enslaved me because I'm constantly judged by how fluent I am in the language. So my fluency is access, but if I was not fluent, it's exclusion. And that exclusion already exists for people who are of um, intersectional identities people who look a certain way. So I cannot erase how I look, but what is going to mitigate that process is how I speak. So if I have perfect command of the language, I get admitted, but that's only on the, with the understanding that I have this command of the language. So historically, just through looking at it from um, the colonial expansionist period where we have missionaries entering countries saying that we're going to uplift the quote unquote primitive by imbuing the Christian language and imbuing a Christian culture, so, so, so to speak, they, people in those indigenous lands have to learn the language, but we forget that we're also erasing the context of the people and their culture. So in terms of systemic and structural, we've created a hierarchy based on how fast you can learn the language, how fast we can interpret and translate and how fluent we are. And especially for people of color and Maja's identities in a, hegemonic state, we also have to understand colloquialisms. What is the everyday language? If we don't, then we're always going to be a perpetual foreigner. Thank you so much, Chi. I think uh, as you were speaking, my, my mind has been expanded a number of times. So thank you so much for that. And I definitely encourage our participants to use the reactions that are available in the Zoom, um, Zoom uh, uh, platform because uh, these are really some powerful thoughts that we are hearing during this discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Chief, for sharing that. Um, we are moving a little bit into the topic of identity here, um, because we have been talking about the experience of what it is to be a person of color today. And, you know, people of color, it is a greatly encompassing term. Um, it is commonly used to describe an extremely diverse group of people and box them into a homogeneous group. And I would like to ask Vanessa, uh, what are some of the challenges attached to the umbrella terms and expectations that all Black people, for example, have homogeneous experiences? Yeah, thank you for the question. So that in of itself, the definition of race is so much closely tied to skin color, but it's, it shouldn't be generalized that way. If you were to look at myself and my husband, he's Nigerian and I'm American and our backgrounds, our experiences are so different from each other, but someone looking at us on the street would just think, this is just a black couple, but really our experiences are so different. And the challenge you can get into when you base race off of just skin color or assume that someone's skin color is an assumption on their race 
it could be a completely different story if you were to get to know them and get to understand a little bit more about where they've come from. Because in our skin colors, we are different. Um, a really good example is that growing up in America, you are a little bit more conditioned to be able to assess the situation wherever you're going to, to also look for others and to see where there are similarities. Um, similar to what Chisholm said, you know, growing up in Nigeria, it's a little bit different because there are other people like you and you kind of understand the races, but in America, it's completely different for African-Americans and our experiences that we go through. When we go into a room, to a party, to a business function, we have to read the room to understand, to get a perception of how we should act and how we should interact with each other. And that's why for, even though race is so heavily based on skin color, it, it should not be because the experiences are different. And also when it comes to racism, some people may think that it's only done on the basis of skin color, something visual that you can see. But in actuality, there are so many other ways that race is inferred that's hidden. Cause you would think, you know, we're in the digital age when we submit job applications, boom, they only see a piece of paper. However, there is a thought process behind that. Someone could look at a name and assume and look at it and be like, based on this name, I think she may be black. So maybe I'm gonna put this to the side. Um, someone may also, you know, when you're doing a school application, as they're running it through maybe an algorithm, they may look at your zip code and think that for this zip code, we usually have poor performers. So we're gonna do that. And you would think this is automated. They're not, they don't even know what your skin color is, but there are hidden ways that it has become, you know, creeped up into where, where biases can come into effect. Um, another good example is um, facial recognition you know, when the police department has been using that just in regards to being able to identify and see if they could trace down criminals. You know, there have been evidence that the algorithms as they're based on the way they input in the information, it incorrectly identifies, you know, people of color. And that's just, and not to get people discouraged, but it's just to start the conversation to really think about, okay, expand your sample size. You know, that's how you can get to that when you're looking at a resume. Don't assume just based on the name what a person's race is. Um, you know, just different ways that you can go about that. But it was just to give an example that even though race is skin color based, there's so many nuances to it. And it's also ways that you can discriminate on racism without ever knowing or seeing that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much for, for explaining this to us in, in more detail with great examples again. Um, I would uh, like to ask the next question to Chisum. Chisum, the, the topics of race and racism are often uncomfortable. Uh, we see that by the number of people who have joined the panel discussion today. <laughs> Those are the brave ones, so we are happy to have you here. Um, but uh, Oftentimes these uh, topics, they, they need to be addressed if we want to see actual change happen. So I kind of have uh, two questions in one. Uh, the first one is how can we develop the skills to talk about racial, biracial and intersectional identities within a workspace? My second question is what degree of race confidence do we need to be able to navigate this topic without causing harm? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, how many hours do we have? Um, no, but um, I want to say first that, you know, uh, um, oftentimes conversations around race, you know, I think I, I just want to say it's also difficult for people of color to engage in. It, it's so difficult for me to engage be, because I find that you know, like I need to, I need to manage my mental health, and sometimes it's just detrimental to 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 try. Uh, but to answer the question, I think uh, uh, you know, educate yourself, do your research, Google, Instagram, all those different platforms, TikTok. They're your friends. There are people on there who actually educate and put content out that are relevant to you. There are books you can buy and read. You know, so follow thought leaders and assess your own unchecked and unconscious bias. Then commit to doing the work every day. You know, knowing that you will make mistakes, and when you make mistakes, own up to it and do better. You know, be curious, be open, ask questions, 
listen to learn, not respond. Uh, 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 an author, I think her name is Ijoma Olu. Uh, she wrote a book, so you want to talk about race, and she suggested some, you know, great, you know, steps. I guess you know, state your intentions. Uh, why exactly are you engaging in this conversation? Uh, keep in mind what the top priority uh, uh, or the goal of the conversation is and don't let emotions get in the way. It's really not about you. Um, anti-racism should not be oppressive against any other groups of people. So you cannot be anti-racist and pro-transphobia or Islamophobia. If you find that you are, you need to return to the drawing board and you know restart the work. Um, I think that uh, uh, doing DEI work or, you know, being an active ally uh, uh, to engage in these conversations means that you don't only get to show up for gender equality or the inequ inequities that are close to your heart, you get to show up for every type of discrimination, bigotry and inequities as well. And also just to clarify that when you're engaging in conversations like this, it's not an oppression Olympics. Each individual is unique uh, in their experience of racism. Uh, and we must not weigh which is worse or better because each person's story and lived experience is valid. Uh, um, so how do we get more confidence? Never assume, you know, when in doubt, ask, uh, 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 unless you're hundred percent, show, you know, ask clarifying questions. Uh, um, it's one of the things I hear quite often, and I think we've all heard it, and some of us might have also say it, uh, said it, is when people say, I don't see color. It's well meaning, you know. Uh, uh, um, imagine, you know, someone saying in the fight for equal pay for women or uh, the popular binary gender equality that you don't see gender and you treat everyone the same, right? So just for a quick public service announcements, please see my color, see my gender, because if you see it, you might recognize that we do not have an equal playing field, right? So we all have a responsibility. Mm. Uh, I, I, I'm just uh, quickly, I, I'm just trying to round up here. Uh, 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 there's a man I read, uh, 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 something he wrote on Medium, and it, was, it went something like, just because you're not personally guilty of creating an unequal or inequitable playing field system or structure does not mean that we are not personally responsible for helping to dismantle and fix it. So as a final word, I think that uh, uh, becoming race confidence and developing skills to, to discuss race and intersectional identities in the workplace can be uncomfortable, but it's okay to lean into that discomfort. You know, like most things, we just have to practice. Practice makes uh, perfect. Yes. Thank you so much, Chisum. I hope that our participants were writing notes because you actually gave us a really good list of practical things we can do. So if not, you can always get back to the recording and, and write it down put it on your board. Um, so thank you so much for this uh, amazing answer. Uh, my next question is for can Kristen. Can on that a little bit? Oh yeah, sure, uh, if you can quickly. Oh yeah, so when it comes to listening to understand, how you put that into practice is a really good example is say you're trying to, you know, someone's told you, oh, I've heard turmeric is really good. And you, when you're looking, doing your research, you're mentally looking for positive feedback to say that, okay, this is good for me, I should take this. And so as you're reading through, you may disregard everything else that you've seen that may speak negatively about it because you're, you've already said in your mind what you're looking for. So when you are listening to understand, you have to be prepared for that you may hear something different. You may hear something that maybe um, contradicts your understanding. So that's what it means to listen to understand is you can still have a previous understanding, but you have to be willing to hear something different. And so that's just wanted to put that out there because it is a different mindset, um, such as when you, you're meeting someone new, you may have heard about them, but to listen to understand is to be prepared to maybe hear something different than what you've heard before. Yes, definitely. So listening and learning with an open mind, not uh, a closed up mindset, definitely. Thank you for adding that, Vanessa. Um, so I would like to ask the next question to Kristin. Um, identity is so complex when we consider intersectionality, right? 
and you are a biracial uh, woman, um, you know, growing up and today, where do you feel you belong? Um, do you think, and, and do you think that white or non-racialized people can experience racism? Two big questions to put together. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that um, understanding the formation of racial identity is particularly hard for multiracial people for obvious reasons. When racial categories were created, they were created by people who didn't intend for us to exist, for the races to mix. Um, so I can really, I will just speak to my own experience. Um, when I was younger, I think that I confused fitting in with belonging. Uh, and belonging can really only happen when we um, can exist as our full, authentic uh, selves. Um, and, you know, as a kid growing up in predominantly white spaces, uh, where race was not really directly addressed or talked about like in a very meaningful way. Um, I didn't have a, I didn't have language or framework for understanding my, my racial identity, uh, the racialized experiences that I had. Um, I had a very ahistorical uh, understanding of race. Um, meaning that I imagined that I was equally white and black um, because I didn't really understand what either of those labels meant. Uh, as I got older, um, as my world became more diverse and I grew more uncomfortable with this like very simplistic, uninformed understanding of race, uh, I became more intentional in, in educating myself um, I grew less inclined to identify primarily as biracial because of my changing understanding of whiteness. Um, you know, depending on how I wear my hair, if it's in curls, if it's straight, if it's in braids, whatever, I can present very racially ambiguous. And I have this, um, had a lot of these interesting experiences where, um, people think that I am them. So I have had Indian people think I'm Indian, Puerto Rican or Dominican people think that I am them, uh, you know, throughout my life. Um, but I have never been confused for a white person. A white person has never thought that I was them. Um, so I think, you know, now I identify as black, uh, black bi and biracial um, because I also understand that being racially ambiguous, uh, my proximity to whiteness does afford me some certain privileges. Um, but yeah, and I, I, I recognize that. And um, this is a very, nuanced and complicated conversation, you know, um, yes. within, you know, among multiracial people, you and, know. And could I just ask uh, the, the yeah. second part of the question, do you think that white or non-racialized people can experience racism, just quickly? Well, uh, the short answer I would argue is no. Uh, and this goes back to the, the, the importance of being specific in what we're talking about. And uh, can, can white people experience um, interpersonal prejudice, uh, other forms of identity-based discrimination? Uh, absolutely, you bet. Um, but you know, we're at a point where most people understand the idea of race being a social construct. But then we need to ask, well, why was it constructed? Who constructed it? And when we try to talk about, when we try to decontextualize race and racism, uh, we erase the true nature and function of racism. It was, it was created to establish white supremacy at the, it's, it's hierarchical in nature. 
uh, and the further uh, from whiteness you go, the further down the ladder that you are. Uh, and this system has uh, endured, uh, it has evolved and it, it, it uh, uh, changes, um, but it's, so if we were to say, if we were to flatten discrimination uh, and you know prejudice and uh, those experiences mm. with racism, we're really erasing basically rendering it meaningless uh, in relation to its yeah true thank context you. Mm. thank you for bringing in the historical perspective as well i think it's it's very important for us to to hear uh you know um these views on it and just acknowledge racism for what it is um so thank you for adding that we only have 30 minutes left uh, for this uh, section of the panel discussion. Only 20 minutes with uh, our dear panelists, Chi, because they will have to leave us uh, 20 minutes past. Uh, so my next question is for you, Chi. Uh, could you tell us more about the currency of race? What does it mean and how is it played out within our identities? Thank you for that question. I feel so... Um humbled by these answers and the how succinct these questions are, um, in particular to racial equity. And I think that I'm just going to describe uh, racial currency stemming off of what Christian said, and that is, uh, we have adjacency as per our color, and race is defined by our physical identifications, and which is what we cannot erase. In some instances, we can make less visible or what we describe as covering. So um, for instance, if we have uh, a fair complexion, we are then by proxy closer to what is considered acceptable, we have access. So the notion of currency in race is our adjacency, our proximity to that privilege. It does not necessarily mean that we have it. It does not necessarily mean that we are given that. And in most instances, it is given and we have to ask permission given how we exist in a hierarchical structure. But that currency allows us to move through space differently than those who may not be allowed to move through that space, which is what Kristen described earlier. This vertical structure is preventative and is prohibitive, and it is based on colorism. And that's the nuance of how we are, and, you know, and it's not just, and that currency allows some of us to move through and some of us to not. So for instance, in America, as an Asian immigrant, there is this perpetual stereotype of being the model minority. So in that regard, I'm given access by that particular perspective compounded by the fact that I speak the language fluently. But once I'm in there, where do I belong, right? So I had been given the currency to move into space, but how much more do I need to put in to move up in that space? So that currency is limited to many in many instances, but it does not negate the fact that we do have certain privileges as per our identity, sometimes race, sometimes our gender. And I, and I think of it because identity is more complex than just this one dimensional idea that I'm defined by my color, I'm also defined by my gender, my sexuality and the multitude of it. And I think, you know, and I think the one thing that I have been thinking a lot about is what the artist and cultural critic Lorraine O'Grady had said. And she had said that in 10 to 20 years down the line, we may not need whiteness to be racist because, there, because as I've described earlier, there's internalized racism and that continues and, and colorism and that exists within all cultures. So I think that that's how I, I would describe the currency of race and it's in describing its mobility for people by proxy and adjacency. Thank you, Chi. This is an extremely deep topic. I would actually love to listen to you just talking about this or the whole panel discussing just the, the topic of, of the currency of, of, of race for two hours straight. Uh, but unfortunately, we have to move on to the next question. Uh, and I would like to ask our panelists to keep their answers crisp 
That would be great so that we can uh, answer as many questions as possible. So my next question is for Vanessa. I think the topic of, of, of gaslighting has been mentioned uh, during the discussion today. And I would like to ask you, what is gaslighting? And with regards to people with varying intersectionalities, why is it important for us to listen, to learn, rather than to question, to gaslight? Of course. Um, so just in a, a brief definition for gaslighting is where a person or a group of people will cause another person or another group of people to question or to doubt either their experience, their understanding, or their skill. And why that is important is because, similar to what Kristen was saying, is that you have your own experience and you bring your own um, perceptions to things. And so when you have either someone or a group of people or an institution constantly telling you that this hasn't happened, you're not understanding it correctly, it definitely demotivates you and can you know, break down in your confidence. A good example of this, and People should really look into kind of the comments that Serena Williams made when um, she was pregnant. But you know, when she went to her doctor and said, "Hey, I'm having complications. Something's not right," she was constantly told, "You're fine. It's okay." And that's just one example of how you can gaslight someone is to try and change their perception and let you know break down their confidence or their understanding for something. And people see this in other areas as well. This could be in relation to either when they're trying to explain to you about you know, their perception of their understanding when it comes to race, but it could also be in other settings. It can be um, in the professional setting where someone says, no, you obviously didn't understand the content for that meeting or the purpose for it. Maybe you did. This could also come, like you said, in healthcare where you see that constantly people of color are not given the same level of care. And also they're similar to having gaslighted where they're saying that you're fine, this is normal, keep going about your day. And so I think that's the reason why this is so important is because just to understand and just to be aware that that does occur. And you can also see that in the education system for students of color, maybe they, maybe they come to a teacher and say, I don't understand it. Like, I don't understand why you can't get this. It must be you versus maybe they just have a different way of learning or they need some just additional help. Thank you for, for answering this question. They all spot on, uh, Vanessa. And um, uh, so far, you know, all these conversations we've been having uh, throughout the more than one year have been connected to the workspace. And um, I would like to ask Chisum. Uh, Chisum, do you think that work workplace can only be confined to our physical or hybrid workspace? or with our team members and leaders, or is it more than that? Um, so short answer, no. Uh, long answer, I, I anticipated this question because Uzan and I have talked about it. And I also uh, did request or ask for permission from Zuzana to share this example. Um, uh, um, so a couple of weeks ago, we were uh, with a panelist talking about, you know, just talking about this topic and, you know, how we'd like to go about it. And I had shared with them that on a recent trip to uh, Copenhagen at the airport, on my way to a work conference in November of last year, I was followed around duty free by a well-meaning white woman in this case. And that day I, 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 you know, I was in a good mood. <laughs> so I turned to her and asked uh, if she could help me steal a perfume. Uh, she was quite stunned, uh, embarrassed and apologetic. Uh, and then, you know, Zuzana had said, uh, uh, is it, it would be great if we could connect, you know, our inputs or my inputs in this case back to the workplace. And I thought about it like, yeah, how can I relate this back to, you know, what happens at work and at the office? And then a light bulb kind of just went off in my head. You know, it's very common for us to think, at least for me, to think that, you know, when it comes to the workplace, I usually think about the physical, digital or hybrid workplace with my team or perhaps a client's office. But actually, a lot of interactions we have in society takes place in somebody's workplace. 
the duty free way I was followed around is some, it's somebody's workplace. The restaurants, when you experience racism or discrimination, is somebody's workplace. The hospital, the school, police station, grocery store, shopping mall, vacation resorts, the public transport system, the bus, the trains, the trams. There are people's workplaces. And diversity, equity, inclusion must also exist there. You know, and I think especially at this point we are where we're looking at work-life integration. You know, when I had that experience, I was on my way to a work conference, you know, and I was followed around the store and that made me feel small, you know, and I'm not expected to park that experience when I arrive at the door. You know, if any of us here were to go on a lunch break and you, you experience sexism, homophobia, racism, transphobia, Islamophobia, we cannot expect you to park that experience at the front door of the office and act like it did not happen because it happened in somebody's workplace and it happened to you. You know, so no, the workplace is most spaces that we engage with. And currently the workplace is also our homes. That's very true. That's a mic drop right there. <laughs> yes, uh, that's what we all have to realize, right? All these conversations we've been having for more than a year about diversity and inclusion in the workplace, it's, it's much more than a workplace or workplace is much more than we are imagining. Uh, so we definitely need to address all these conversations from, from that viewpoint and all these panel discussions that we are going to have in the future and that we've been having. Um, I would like to ask the next question to Kristen. Kristen, so how can we address the topics of racism, anti-racism, racial equity in our families, in the workplaces and the societies at large, because all of that is someone's workplace at the end? I would say first to normalize talking about race. Um, you know, I, I think that there is this uh, really intense hesitancy to, to, to talk about race. And I, especially uh, for parents uh, and especially particularly white parents, and there's fear of not knowing how to have the conversations. Um, there's this um, idea that talking about racism is what perpetuates racism, even though actually the opposite is true. Um, and I have, I have empathy, I have empathy for that. Um, you know, I have empathy for this kind of, it's, it's almost kind of a form of magical thinking that if we, if I don't address it with my kids, then it won't exist. Um, or if I, it doesn't matter to me, or if it shouldn't matter, then it doesn't matter. Um, but it does. So I think that we need to first normalize talking about it and not being afraid to talk about it because it's actually uh, empowering. Um, you know, oppressive systems adapt by becoming less visible uh, and that give us permission to be indifferent to them. Um, so we know that we know that children are natural born learners. They're constantly making observations uh, they're noticing things, and our role uh, is is, uh, in, is supporting them. Uh, is asking questions that promote reflection, um, show, signaling that you know we 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 can talk about these things. It's not being bad or or, or shameful, um, and then pro providing uh, age appropriate. Um, you know, we, we can take our cues from, from uh, its uh, context, a historical and social context so that the conclusions they end up drawing are informed. Uh, because when we don't do that, when we don't talk about how we got here, uh, we, we, are we are very vulnerable and susceptible to uh, accepting racist ideas uh, without realizing it. So uh, I would say to normalize it, uh, and I think it starts in the family, you know, it, it starts in our home, it starts with us, you know, be the change. Uh, and then when we ha have these conversations in the workplace, 
you know, the, the terror and intensity level is down uh, because it's not the first time that you're thinking critically and, and reflecting on, on race and, and unpacking your own uh, racial biases and uh, assumptions, right? So uh, yeah, I think that this has to come with, mm. with nor normalizing, talking about it and, um, you know, nothing, nothing can be, uh, not everything that is faced can be changed, but not, but that can be changed if it's not faced. Uh, yes. James, James Baldwin said that. So we have to take the, the fear out of So we have to face the uncomfortable first. Thank you for answering that, Kristen. So we are only having a uh, tea here with us for the next three minutes. That's why I would just like to ask them one last question before they have to leave us. Uh, so my question is very quickly, Chi, could you tell us what is the emotional tax carried by people of color at the workplace and the society at large? And, and why do racialized people often feel the pressure that they must represent their entire umbrella group, uh, whereas white people don't bear that burden? Could you just answer quickly before you have to go? Yes, uh, thank you. Um... So, and also I apologize, I have to uh, drop out of the meeting, but to answer the question is that I think it circles back to what Vanessa said earlier that we're not monolith. We can conflate all of our identities and make it into one as people of color juxtaposed to the Western tradition, which also goes back to what Kristen also had touched upon on in terms of how this, this idea of the Western versus the other and how that's perceived. And the emotional tax comes when we have to relive it each time we have to talk about it in the workplace. Each time when we ask somebody that is of color or of marginalized entity to express what it means for them in terms of noticing a look, noticing a tone, noticing uh, someone stepping away from me because during COVID, I'm Asian behind a mask. Those nuances that we live through as racialized spaces is recreating a trauma. And in recreating the trauma, we have to address it. But in addressing it, we're still reliving it. So I think that's the emotional tax we have in the workspace and even socially when we are, when spaces are racialized as well as genderized. And so we can't erase our race and our gender. And in not being able to do that, we are entering a space where we're constantly un being looked at and being watched or that sensibility of feeling that. And when we feel that way, we are constantly wondering, is this where our, what's safe? Where is our place, especially in the workspace? And I know that it's become very, very um, prolific in having these conversations, but it also has been very detrimental because it's exhausting for people of color, for people who have marginalized identity to talk about. I love talking about it because it affects me directly. But do I talk about it to a point of ex exhaustion for everyone else? Maybe then they'll be more sensitive to it as opposed to desensitized to it. But at the same time, it's taxing in the sense that I have to relive those moments of trauma that I or other people may have experienced to make sure that they understand that we're not this monolith and that my experiences is not the same as Chizo, who is a Black woman or Vanessa or Christine, but I can only speak for me or those may have experiences that are aligned and akin to me that they can think about the next time they engage someone of my identity and not overstep those boundaries or maybe overstep those boundaries, but be generous about your failure and be ready to be, because I'm not gonna deny you, but don't deny me either so that we don't have to bury that way and carry that way. And to sort of close in terms of why white people don't have to think about it is because I can only speak of it in America and because I think I have mentioned it before in other conversation that in, Euro, in Europe, it's different because so much of it happened offshore. The British did not colonize internally, they colonized offshore. So what happens is happening beyond that space. So when it's happening beyond that space, for, they don't have to think about that racialized space for them anymore. In America, it's only now that they're thinking about that racialized space in a more critical sense. Historically, it was a way to subjugate others. And that juxtaposition of having that standard, having that benchmark defined by quote unquote whiteness or Western tradition is, has allowed them to not have to think about or speak to the fact that they represent 
an entire population of people that may look like them as well. And thank you so much. I have to depart. Have a good day. Thanks, Jean. Have a good day. Thank you so much for all your wisdom. Pleasure. Yes. Uh, so that was the brilliant Chile. And we are hoping to have them joining more of our panel discussions in the future. Uh, we have a few questions left before we jump into the Q&A session. Uh, so please, our dear, dear participants, ask your questions uh, so that we can get to it right away in a few minutes. Uh, I do have a question. Uh, I have a few questions here, and I'm thinking just to, to, to come back to Chisholm. If we could keep these answers uh, crisp, then we can answer everything we have prepared. Uh, so I have a question for you, Chisholm. Uh, acts of racism are often perceived as these obvious malicious acts of conscious hatred, as I have already mentioned. And that is, however, far from the daily realities that racialized groups encounter each day. And while we did talk about the topic of microaggressions during a number of our panel discussions, could you please uh, explain the term to our audience once more? Uh, yes, I will try. Uh, uh, thank you, Susanna. Uh, so microaggressions uh, is a term that was coined by, uh, by Chester M. Pierce. Uh, uh, and basically the uh, common verbal, behavioral, or you know, environmental slights that are often uh, 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 unintentional. Uh, uh, they communicate, you know, uh, hostile or negative attitudes towards you know, stigmatize or culturally marginalize groups of people uh, 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 across various intersections, such as race, gender, you know, ethnicity, age, all of this. Uh, uh, a, um, someone I follow on uh, on social media, uh, his name is Ka Kalhil Green. Uh, um, he, he said something about microaggressions, which I thought was really uh, uh, a really crisp way to put it in terms of oftentimes people think of microaggressions as oh it's something small and it, it only has a small impact but actually the micro part, uh, uh, part of things actually goes to refer to the size of the action right so uh, uh, which would be something as small as a comment but it doesn't refer to the impact of that action, right? Because the impact of microaggression can be emotionally and mentally violent, uh, uh, regardless of your good intent. So when you say something like, that's so gay, or your English is good, or where are you from? It's a form of microaggression. And to the receiver, that means more to them than you think it means, right? Uh, uh, so it's always good to pay attention to the fact that intent is different from impact. And of course, you know, uh, uh, Vanessa talked about gaslighting. So gaslighting, uh, say mansplaining, white splaining, anti-blackness, they're all forms of microaggressions that uh, are rooted in racism. Thank you so much for explaining that to someone. I think we could be repeating this uh, definition or explaining what it is at every session and, and still we would need to hear it again and again to really let it sink in and understand what it actually means. Um, I would like to ask a question to Vanessa because she's so great with examples. Um, so Vanessa, what are the three options you see you have in responding to racist, either subtle or pervasive situations? And how do you decide which path to take? Thank you for the question. Um, you know, every day is different in terms of where you're coming from, where your energy levels are. And so whenever I do encounter racism or discrimination, you know, I always think back to, you know, there's different paths that you can take at any given time. And for myself, you know, sometimes, maybe sometimes you wanna be the example and you wanna take the high road. Um, sometimes you wanna be the one that educates, you know, help someone to understand where you're coming from. And then there are other days that you just wanna be the one that engages, the one that does action. And so I, you may be at a different point at any given day, at any given time. And so I would speak to the audience is that when you do come across someone and you're assuming, okay, maybe she's just an angry black woman, you know, maybe it is because that day, maybe I was trying to lead by example the whole day, but as 
successful as it came through, maybe you get beat down and then you make it to the point where, okay, now I need to act. I want to be the one that engages. And maybe for the next day, maybe you wanna take a step back and think today, if I do encounter racism, I wanna use it as a chance to educate. So I would tell people that, you know, don't assume that every person of color is angry. Every person of color is, you know, disheartened. It just may be that for that situation or for that day, you know, things may have stacked up against them. Um, it may be that they're fired up and they have that energy and that passion and they are ready to engage. Or it just may be that they're in a reflective mode and they just really want to help educate people. And I say that applies for people on both sides of the aisle is that we need people of color um, wherever you are in terms of your energy. You know, it may be different at any given day, but don't give up. If today is a day that you want to lead by example, you know, do that. We need that. Or the time you want to be the one that educates or engages. And also for people across the aisle, for non-people you know, non of color, is we need people who want to lead by example. So if you're in a situation where you do see racism, you know, give it a name. You know, in a previous role, I had a really great boss, so amazing. And he was there at a situation where he was there with me as I experienced racism and he stepped in, you know, gave it a name and said, I think you really should be asking her. She's the subject matter expert in this. That's what it means to be at a stage where maybe you want to educate someone and maybe you are fired up and you're ready to, you know, um, you know, protest. You're ready to write to your congressman. Those are the times when you're ready to engage. Both sides of the aisles can do that. And it really takes everyone, you know, the people who are out there fighting and engaging, they need the people who are, who have the energy to educate because once you get people to look and pay attention, you need the people to educate to be the ones to help start the conversation, to help give the history, to help give the context. And for people who educate, we really need the people who are the example so that we know what does the future look like? What can it look like? And so I would say to everyone, it takes everyone together and you don't always have to be the, if, you, if you're tired, you don't always have to be the one that fight. Um, you can take a different path for that day, depending on where your energy level is. But I would mm -hmm. also speak to other people when they say, what can I do? Whatever you have the energy to do, we'll take it. Mm -hmm. You know, we are, we're ready, we're willing, and we are so appreciative on both sides of the aisle. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And I think we can just close up this uh, section in the spirit of giving examples and tips. Vanessa has already started that. So we always like to finish up our uh, panel discussion section by you know, asking for practical tips. So we're gonna do that again today. And I would just like to ask our panelists to answer quickly and give us a top one tip for companies and individuals to address the challenges of racial equity within their workspace. Huge question, but can you can you give us one tip? And I think we can start with Chisum. Okay, um, I think everyone today, uh, Chi, Vanessa, and uh, uh, Kristen have said it. Uh, uh, the first step is to have an open and honest discussion about the issue of racial equity with your employees in your home, with your friends and your family, with your uncle. Uh, and just uh, one thing quickly is, uh, um, I, I read also somewhere, I read a lot. <laughs> um, so the real change for an organization, it's not figuring out what can we do, but are we willing to do it? So I will leave you all with that. Thank you for that tip. Uh, next, I would like to ask Kristen. Uh, <clears throat> I would say uh, to set an intention uh, to really do the, the deep transformative work uh, that is Relation, relationally focused, uh, superficial DEI efforts can actually cause more harm and really uh, harm a, uh, a team. Uh, we all know how important psychological safety is uh, in the workplace. And um, so I would say to, to set an intention to not do the superficial checking the box things, uh, but to start to do the work within yourself uh, and educating yourself, being intentional about 
getting diverse voices in your life. Uh, if you don't have people in your network uh, that are willing to do that emotional labor for emotional labor for you, you know, there's books, there's podcasts, there's uh, uh, social media uh, content creators. Um, so yeah, it's that the commitment to start with yourself. Um, yeah. Thank you for your tip, uh, for your top tip, Kristin. And uh, last on my screen is Vanessa. What is your top tip? Um, my top tip for being in the workplace, I would say for on um, both people on both sides of the aisle would be to, if, if you see it. I'm, I'm sorry, Vanessa. Um, no, give it a name. Try your best just, to help. Just a second. Can you repeat yourself? Because it was uh, breaking a little. Oh, okay. Um, I was saying that for on both sides of the aisle, I would say if you ever see someone experiencing racism, you know, give it a name, you know, try to correct the situation. We're not asking you to, you know, start a fight or to get into an argument. But if you see someone who is constantly marginalizing someone else, say, excuse me, I think her comment is valid. His, her, they comment is valid. Please let them speak. If you see someone who is constantly, you know, not being invited somewhere to say, hey, maybe we should invite so-and-so. Similar to how you would see if someone were to, you know, drop their things in a grocery store, you would offer to help. I would say that is so impactful. You may think it's so small, but for that person, that may be something that they reflect on for years. Thank you for wrapping that up, Vanessa. So that was our last question. Um, we asked uh, for the top tip for companies and individuals to address the challenges of racial equity within their workspace. Uh, Chisum mentioned that just being willing to do it is extremely important. Uh, Kristen mentioned that it's important to set up an intention and keep it real. So no performative allyship happening in here. And uh, Vanessa uh, wrapped it up by saying that we should be able to give situations and realities a name, name them, speak up. Uh, so thank you all so much. Uh, one and a half hour has uh, passed so quickly. And uh, we have heard a lot of really insightful views. You have shared your knowledge and, and, and we are very grateful for that. Uh, so I think that now it's time to move on to uh, the Q&A part of this discussion, uh, which involves our amazing uh, participants and viewers. Um, I have been getting messages from my colleague Nikki, who has been collecting all your questions. Uh, so I would like to start uh, by a rather complicated question. I have been trying to decode it uh, a little bit you know, while I, I saw it coming, but um, yes, let me just read it out loud. And I, I believe that you will know what to answer. So it is a question from Mustafa on LinkedIn. And the question is, it's kind of two questions in one, and there are some thoughts in between, but let me read it. Is oh, race, <laughs> oh yeah, you should be, it's a big one. So is race a collective notion or is based on an individual's definition of oneself? Now we continue. If it's a collective concept in which I personally believe, so Mustafa believes that, uh, that's why there's the racially specific development of a language and even literature of a specific community over history. Then what are the indicators that would illustrate the survival of that racial group? So maybe let's just answer the first part of the question and let's see if we are able to wrap our heads around the rest. So the question, the first part is, is race a collective notion or based on an individual's definition of oneself? Who would like to answer this? I wouldn't mind answering that. <laughs> um, I would agree with you, Mustafa. I think it definitely is a collective construct because even in situations where um, you have more of a homogenous group, there will be other ways that people are separated or differentiated. Race is just one way for our, you know, the world's collective that we found a way to distinguish, 
you know, to separate people. And so if it was just one person, there's nothing to compare, there's nothing to separate or differentiate in that respect. Um, I would, if I may, uh, sorry, Kristen, go on. No, okay. go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to say, I think it could be both. Uh, um, I think it could also be an individual construct um, because sometimes a person's race is not always visible, right? Uh, so how do we know how people identify? Perhaps the closest thing I can bring to this, uh, uh, the, the lady who recently won the Australian uh, um, Open, perhaps there was a whole thing about her race and her identity where she identified as an indigenous person, but she presents as white. And then there was this whole shebang about it. So I think both can actually coexist. Uh, 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 so I think, yeah, we, it, it's a collective construct and it can also be an individual construct and an individual construct is also valid based on their, their lived experience. You know, uh, I know personally some black people who are very light skinned, you know, and they're not biracial. And then, you know, you're saying I'm black, but like, well, are, are you really, are you sure you're not biracial, right? So I think it can be both. Kristen, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I think the way that I would talk about it is that it is, as a social construct, you know, it, it uh, is a collective uh, identity, uh, but then we have our own individual relationships to those, that, to those constructs. So um, both of those factor into our individual racial identities, both the way uh, the world experiences me and the way I experience the world factor into my individual identity, uh, but race is socially constructed. So it's, I think that's how I would frame it. Uh, yes, thank you for those answers. So, so Mustafa also believes it's a collective concept. And if it is a collective concept, then there's the racially specific development of a language, literature of a specific community over history. And the, the next question is, what are the indicators that would illustrate the survival of that racial group? Now, this is where I'm struggling a bit to understand. And I don't know if, uh, if the panelists do understand this question. If not, maybe we can ask Mustafa to elaborate in the comments on LinkedIn so that we can get back to it if we get more clarification. I think it's nice to get more clarity just so we don't assume what you know they are trying to say. <laughs> yeah. All right. So Mustafa, please, if you can if you can clarify a little bit on what you mean by by the second part of the question, that would be great so that we can answer it. And we can move on to the next question we have from Anna. Uh, it's a question about language. Uh, so what is the best way to approach language in, in case of talking about racial equity, I assume? How do you clarify? How do you do it at the start of the conversation? Uh, she says she's always afraid to insult or to be incorrect. And then she just freezes. So she kind of, yeah, doesn't uh, get deep into those conversations. So what is the best way to approach it? If I could just say quickly, uh, speak to the fear of saying something offensive. Uh, probably inevitably you will, we all will. What and I think that most people uh, are pretty generous if you make an honest, simple mistake. Uh, what really matters if you want to continue the conversation is how you respond to being corrected. And I think that when I hear people say, I'm afraid of saying something wrong, are you afraid of being corrected? And if we could confront that fear and just respond in a way that is um, not, not be defensive, not explain yourself, not overly apologetic, uh, because that kind of a reaction can make the person feel that they need to do some emotional labor to reassure you that it's okay, uh, that you said, or, you know, if you um, mis misgender somebody, or if you uh, 
um, you know, use a term that you didn't know was considered offensive. You know, a, a lot of people, there's a terrible word that used to be used for half black and half white people, mulatto, it's got terrible connotations uh, of, yeah, well, that's the whole thing. Um, but yeah, I just wanna say, you probably will get some things wrong, you probably will say some things wrong, and the important thing is how you follow up with just being corrected. Well, I, I, I agree. <laughs> And I completely agree with uh, Kristen as well. Uh, I, I just wanted to share a personal example that happened to me recently. A really dear friend of mine, uh, 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 we're somewhere together with our kids and uh, um, uh, my daughter had, you know, this uh, a toy and, you know, she put it on, you know, my dear friend's uh, uh, hair and her son's hair, they're both white. Uh, and then, you know, nothing was said and my daughter came to put it on my hair and, you know, my friend said, oh, it's going to get stuck there. You know, and I, my first reaction was, uh, right. And I didn't say anything. And I kind of just zoned out uh, uh, because I did not want to bring something up there uh, uh, to, so my daughter would feel as though there was something wrong. Uh, and when I did have an opportunity to, to talk about it later on, I struggled. Do, do I bring it up? Should I not? You know, like this is very uncomfortable. I know that, you know, she didn't mean it. Um, and, but I did anyway, because I felt, you know, you're in our lives, you're going to be in my life, hopefully forever, you're going to be around my kid, my daughter has my kind of hair, and it's really important, you know, the way you speak about my hair and the way you speak about my daughter's hair matters, and, you know, when I brought it up, you know, she was like, you know, the minute I said it, I, I knew I said something wrong, and I don't know if you heard me, you know, when she tried to put, you know, this thing back in my hair, I, I um, you know, I said, oh, it's going to get stuck there just to normalize it, right? So I really appreciated that honesty in, in saying like, uh, uh, yeah, I knew I did something wrong there and I tried to fix it immediately. Now, the next step, of course, would have been if she also brought it up and I didn't have to bring it up, then it also just makes for an easy conversation. But nonetheless, I still appreciated that, you know, it, it was just the honest, I messed up and I'm and the honest, uh, the, the, the apology was real, you know? So I think we will mess up along the way. And, you know, right now we're talking about race, but I've also been in situation where I've messed up with people who are transgender or people who are non-binary. And I have to like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I said this and I shouldn't have said it. I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm gonna do better. So when you find that you make a mistake, you know, be honest about it, apologize and be better. Thank you. I, I feel Vanessa wanted to, to share something as well at some point or not? No, not for this one. <laughs> I thought she did a great job explaining. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for, for sharing the, the example as well, Chisum. Um, I have to say for myself, as a white person moderating this session, I was I was very aware of, of my position within this conversation. And, and today I have to say, I felt more nervous about moderating it because we are afraid, many people are afraid to make a mistake within these conversations. Uh, so yes, uh, I think we all just have to step into, lean into the, the uncomfort of it and, and accept uh, and, and apologize in, in case. We make a mistake that's it's a part of learning uh so i would like to uh, move on to the next question that we again got on linkedin so that's really nice that we are getting people engaged on linkedin as well uh, it's a question from leold so i hope i'm pronouncing your name well and the question is how can we make leaders of institutions and companies aware of the benefits of diversity uh, awareness and conviction are more important are important to promote diversity. The question is, how can we do it? So how can we make leaders and companies aware of the benefits of diversity? Do you want to take this, Christine? I don't I don't think I have a good answer for that. Yeah. Um, um I think 
I, I, I know the answer for this, but I feel like I, we really need to move away from like, do we, how do we make leaders know about the benefit of diversity? I mean, are, are, you, are, are we still here? Uh, I mean, it's, yes, but... yeah, so um, that's just my struggle currently is it is beneficial. There is, there, there, we have research and research and research. Uh, uh, um, more diverse teams are more productive. They, they make more money, la -di -la, -di la like it, it's a fact. Right, and I think what we need to move towards is how can we make diverse teams included, right? Because sometimes when we then have like, you know, a diverse team, we're like, oh, we're good, we've done the work. But it's how do you actually make people feel seen, heard and encourage them to thrive and empower them to show up as they are and create that psychological safety that they need. Uh, um, so I think in terms of uh, uh, um, how we can make leaders understand that, I, I, and I do appreciate the question because I know that some leaders are not there yet, uh, but you know, there is, we have data, we have research. So it's much easier to appeal to them from a pragmatic, uh, what you can prove matter of fact standpoint than an emotional standpoint, right? Uh, diversity and including people is a human condition. It's just being a decent human being, but okay, let's go to the research and the data and the facts. Zuzana, you're on mute. Yes. Um, I think a great way to, to make uh, leaders of institutions and companies aware of the benefits of diversity and learn more about it is to refer them to our panel discussions. <laughs> so they will hear it from us again and again and again. Uh, I have a question from Lynn, and it's a question for Chris, uh, to Kristin, but there's a little bit of preface to it. So I'm just going to read it the way it was written. So Lynn wrote, as a biracial person, I sometimes find it hard to figure out to what extent I have a say in certain discussions or rooms. First question, how would you recommend people with biracial backgrounds to navigate these discussions in a way that we don't overstep because of certain privileges we carry because of our proximity to whiteness? Second question, the other way around, how would you recommend us to navigate the conversations about race with Caucasians who perceive you as the other? Um, so if you want me, I, ca I can just read the first question once more. Okay, yeah. So the first question, how would you recommend people with biracial backgrounds to navigate these discussions in a way that we don't overstep because of certain privileges we carry because of our proximity to whiteness? Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, and I think that, um, I think that in whenever we are discussing an issue, I think that we should center the voices of those who are most impacted by uh, the issue at hand. And that requires a level of self-awareness of, you know, where if we are having a conversation about colorism, uh, and there's, I, I have the awareness that I benefit from, from colorism uh, and that I need to be mindful that I don't, um, center my as the beneficiary that I don't center my voice and my experience in the conversation. Um, so I don't think there's a, a, a cut and dried answer here. It has to do with uh, awareness and tension and really thinking about, okay, what is what are we addressing? Uh, who is most impacted by it? Uh, who is advantaged or disadvantaged by it? Uh, and making sure that, you know, you are, uh, yeah, centering those voices of those who are most impacted. Uh, I hope that this uh, answer, I believe that this answer uh, yeah. definitely uh, would be sufficient uh, for our first question from Lind. But uh, there is one more question from her. Um, connected to, you know, being a biracial person, the other way around, how would you recommend us to navigate the conversations about race with Caucasians who perceive you as the other? 
Um, I'm not sure uh, the it would depend on the context, uh, the relationship I have with the uh, Caucasian person that I'm talking to. Uh, do we have any shared history? Do we have any shared understanding? Um, you know, a conversation that I have with my husband who is white Norwegian uh, is, going to be different than a conversation I have with a new friend on about on the bus. Um, so it really depends on the re relational context. Uh, and if you want to take up difficult conversations of any kind, whether it's about race or politics or whatever, if you want those conversations to be meaningful, to be productive, uh, you have to do a little work up front to build a connection. Uh, and build a, a groundwork of, of mutual understanding. Um, but I'm not sure that that answers the, the question. Uh, yeah. Uh, Maybe. I just also wanted to say, uh, and I'm not answering the question because I don't know what it is to be a biracial person, but I just really appreciate uh, uh, your inputs here, uh, uh, Christine. Uh, and, and, you know, I've talked to you about this. I have a biracial daughter and I just feel like, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, because I, I know that I don't know what I'm doing. It's easy if she we're just black and Nigerian and, you know, I, I know what to do. So I really appreciate. So thank you. But I just will also say I'm also a mother. I have three kids uh, who all present differently. And so I, I share, I, I empathize with that. I'm not totally sure what I'm doing. The language that I have used to articulate my experience and my identity, uh, I don't think it's going to be sufficient for my kids as they get older. They're going to develop in their own way of talking about who they are, how they experience the world, how the world experiences them. Um, so, you know, I know what it is to have parents who look different than me. And now I have kids who look different than me. Um, so, you know, I'm just going, I just approach parenting uh, with a, an open mind and trust that they're gonna, they're gonna have their own journey. Like I had to have my own journey and I'm here to support them and not make assumptions about how they're gonna identify or feel about the way that they look. Mm. Yeah, it's it, it's an extremely complex topic, and and there's no one answer for this. Um, so thank you so much, Lynn, for asking, and, and thank you so much, Kristen, uh, for answering, and, and Chisum for for adding uh, a little bit in there. Um, we do have a few more minutes left, uh, so I have a question here from Matunda. Uh, who is asking, how can we help our white friends learn more about racial inequalities without having to be the ones to educate them? And we're talking about especially those who don't believe that the inequalities are legitimate. So um, just first start, like how, how much do we like them? How much do we want to have them? <laughs> like how much do we want to have them in our lives, right? <laughs> So if you have, I think that's the first conversation you need to have with yourself. Like, do I really need this person in my life? Do I love them? Do I want them? And then if the answer is yes, you could start buying them, you know, Christmas and uh, uh, birthday presents could be nice books. They could read so you don't have to do the work. Uh, um, but I think, you know, every relationship is an investment. And there's a lot we can also learn from talking to them uh, if that is not that emotional, you know. I feel like I have a lot of white friends who I discuss race with. And I find it quite nourishing. And I think it also gives me a perspective into how my particular white friends think about race and it creates more nuance for me. Uh, so I think that the, the beginning, at least for me, is starting point is just like, do I really want to have you in my life? Because I can tell you that uh, at the onset of BLM, there were a few friends that I said goodbye to, and I'm very happy that I did. And I have not looked back, right? And there were some people that I really love you and I want to have you in my life, so I'm going to put in the work. And sometimes the work is, I don't want to sit here and talk to you and explain to you and rehash trauma, but I can recommend some books that I think you should read. And if you care about me, uh, you would read. And then we can talk about what you read. 
I'd love to hear from the others though. <laughs> Professor Rosen. Uh, well, I would echo uh, a lot of what Chisholm just said uh, when uh, the race racial conversations really came to the forefront in 2020, and it became very clear very quickly uh, who cared and who didn't. And for me, um, it is painful to realize how many people don't care. Um, and if I have to ask you to care, it's, um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't see how, uh, to me, it, it, it feels, it feels very dehumanizing. Uh, to have to ask somebody to try to understand your existence, uh, to ask to be seen and to be believed. Um, so, yeah, uh, like Chisholm said, do you have to ask, do I want to invest emotional labor because it is incredibly vulnerable? Uh, to have these conversations uh, with somebody who is not um, committed to understanding you and to, and to learning and educating themselves and opening their mind. Uh, yes, and Vanessa, we have lost you for a little bit, but now I see yeah. you're back. Uh, would you like to add anything and give any tips to, uh, to Matunda? We yes, actually I do. And you know, my first tip is, oh, can you hear me okay? Okay, so yes, my first tip is, yeah. my first tip is make sure they're ready. You know, it's very hard to speak to someone who is not ready, not willing, not open. And so, you know, you can try your best to, you know, beat the door down, but you have to make sure that they're ready to open the door, to open the door to the conversation because it will make it so much more impactful for both of you. And so if you know that they're not ready, you know, don't go there, wait until they are, because it definitely takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of effort. And if they're not ready, you should wait. And if, you know, maybe they'll never be ready and that's okay. There's so much more ways that you can make an impact on someone else, another group, another person. Um, and so, you know, some, for some people that is very heartbreaking because you want so badly for them to understand where you're coming from but you have to realize that that other person has to be ready and has to be willing as well to have the conversation. And so you just need to make sure it's from a mutual space in that respect. And I would say that from a professional place in the workplace, no matter where the workplace is, but also from a personal place as well. I was uh, muted again. Uh, so thank you for adding that, Vanessa, and, and big thanks to all of our amazing panelists. Uh, thank you, Chisholm. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Vanessa, and as well, Chi, who is not with us anymore. Uh, it's 3 p.m., which means that our panel discussion has come to an end, uh, and it has been an extremely insightful uh, discussion. I think we have all expanded our minds within these last two hours. Um, and uh, I would just like to thank also to all, to say thank you to all our participants who have engaged with us, who have actively listened with an open mind and who showed up today. Um, our next panel discussion uh, will take place on the 23rd of March. And the topic will be creating a human-centric hybrid work environment. So yes, a lot of workspaces have been hybrid lately. So, you know, how can we make it more human? Um, so once again, thank you all for, for joining us today. And we are looking forward to uh, seeing you next month. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, thank Christine. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Susanna. Thank you all for, for joining us. I think we can stop recording and uh...